Matthew, so great to have you with us. Really appreciate your time. I know you're a man that's very much in demand and your time is very sought after. So really grateful to have you here. Matthew is basically expert in everything investing and is part of some of the biggest blockchain and other tech investments going with Fifth Era with Kiritsu and um, has invested or been part of the investments in a lot of different companies. Thank you. So background, as Erica mentioned, you know, she and I have known each other for a while because I am also very fintech and blockchain focused in my personal investing. And we talked a little bit about what would be most valuable to uh, you, those of you who are entrepreneurs, CEOs of companies raising capital, especially right now. And that's something that over the last 15 years, I've spent a lot of time worrying about. And the reason for that is that I became an active angel investor 20 years ago with Band of Angels and then with Koretsu Forum. And I've had a role at Koretsu as president in San Francisco of the chapters here. And now, uh, and for the last few years, I've been one of the managing partners managing the co-investment funds. Because in addition to being the world's largest angel network, and backing more technology companies uh, than anyone else in America. We also have a small number of funds that uh, fill, off, uh, fill out the round. So last money in, if you will. We're agnostic to industry. So we back companies in every industry. And we have about 55 chapters around the world, though we don't really have much of a UK presence. Um, we, we are in Europe. We have good chapters in places from uh, Barcelona and Madrid to Istanbul and Stockholm, but uh, our London presence is not very substantial. But so what I'm gonna do in the next 30 minutes is I'm gonna share the, my view on what the best uh, entrepreneurs do when they try and raise money. And it's not as conventional as I typically see online. And so in that sense, this is a little bit different from what you may often hear when you go online and you say, how should I pitch angels or early stage investors? But I think it's right. And after having seen thousands of entrepreneurs pitch, I've tried to condense sort of the top 10 things you need to worry about. And that's what I'm gonna go after. Uh, this is simply the rankings from 2019. Correct to actually back to more like 200 companies, but some of them didn't qualify for pitch book. A lot of them don't qualify for pitch book, but you can get a sense of the magnitude. This is the U.S. companies that we backed and NEA and Kleiner Perkins being well-known VC funds. These are the 10 tips, if you will, that I'm going to go, after and, uh, go over, and I'm going to go over them quite quickly. The first thing is an obvious thing. Know who you are targeting. And I'm struck by the fact that most entrepreneurs think they're going to raise money from venture capitalists. But as I'm about to show you, that just isn't true. Uh, in the formation phase, all the way through to the Series A, in practice, your target isn't going to be venture capitalists. And this is very important because the reasons why investors are investing vary by the type of investor they are. And so you need to be very clear on who you're investing in, you're raising money from. So this is the conventional view. I mean, the conventional view, and you'll read about this, is that uh, early stage companies raise money in a series of phases, initially from the three Fs, friends, fa uh, family, and founder, and friends, founders, families, and friends. Then they'll go to angels and angel networks. Then they'll look to venture capitalists and eventually they'll drive for exits. And in, in the popular uh, vernacular, it's all about VCs. And in fact, if you read the press, it is all about VCs. You never read in the press about anyone else other than the unicorns and the venture capitalists. That simply isn't how it works. It doesn't work like that in, in, in America for sure. And all of my time in Europe and with EBAN and others suggests to me it doesn't work like that in Europe either. There's actually two completely different funding ecosystems, and you need to know which one you are in the midst of and who you're speaking to. The first is the angel ecosystem, and this in America is more than 85% of the 70,000 uh, companies being backed every year, technology companies being backed every year. It does begin with friends, families, and founders, uh, but 
it's then all about angels and family offices. And those companies will never see uh, a venture capitalist at all. And 90% of them will exit. If they do exit, they'll exit through corporate acquisitions. So this is about building companies to sell to larger companies. And so you need to be able to tell a story about why what you're building is going to be attractive to an acquirer. Now, the other ecosystem is in fact the venture capital ecosystem. And here, the VCs are very focused on a different game. They want to back companies that they believe they can build into unicorns. And of course, the aspiration is that those will become public companies, but in practice, they never do. Um, and we'll talk about that, but less than 1% of back technology companies ever go public. So the public market is actually not where companies are going to exit to, it's still corporate acquisitions. So what's really going on here is 90% of the deals venture capitalists will eventually back will have angels or family offices already involved. That's the crossover between the two ecosystems. And only 10% of the deals VCs back will come to them without an angel involved. And so the so what of this is if you're going to raise money, you're going to be raising it from angels individual and in groups as well as family offices and you've got to know how to speak their language and i'll come back to that later the second point is it's really not about you now obviously it is it's about the entrepreneur and the vision and the ambition and the company that you're building and the product and the needs that you're addressing we know that but when you're actually pitching it isn't about you it's about them and the question is, how do you engage them? How do you engage the investors in the room and get them interested in your project? And what we see more often than not is that the entrepreneurs come in and all they want to talk about is them. You know, this is my idea. This is what I'm doing. This is why I came across this, this revelation. This is my business plan. This is my product. And they completely forget to engage with the investor. Why are you interested in this space? What's motivating your investment? Why might you be interested in adding another company to your portfolio? What sort of an investor are you? And unless you ask those questions, you won't be targeting the reasons why they may choose to invest. So this is also a very important point, and I'll come back to this also later. Now, the first thing when you do think about uh, the investor first is that you, you need to understand that the investor is all about no. Most investors are overwhelmed with inbound deal flow and their mindset is that they are going to say no. At Koretsu, where we have about 4,000 angel investors as members, the average member is only doing two or three or four early stage deals per year. But even at Koretsu, on a monthly basis, they're going to be seeing at minimum, perhaps 100 companies present. And so over the course of a year, they're going to make two, three, four investments out of 100 plus. And the really active angels might be seeing thousands of deals. So their mindset is at the beginning, I'm going to say no. And that's going to be awkward. And it's going to be a little bit embarrassing. And I don't like letting down the entrepreneur. And I don't want to be nasty to them. But I'm going to say no. And so what you're actually trying to do in these presentations is to shift their mindset, not from no to yes, but from no to maybe. And this is also very important. Most entrepreneurs, when they're pitching their company, think that they're going to get a yes, and they're not going to get a yes. They might get a maybe. And so pitching for maybe is actually the secret for a successful presentation, especially a virtual one online. So, so what in practice does that mean? Well, the entrepreneur, the, the investors have uh, a set of con conventional reasons for saying no. You can think of them as objections. And those objections in their head are what you're trying to overcome. And you've got to overcome them quickly. These are the 10 principal reasons why an investor will say no to you. And, and it's not rocket science. You know, your idea isn't big enough your solution isn't really sufficient to solve the problem. No one's going to buy this. It won't scale. It won't make money. You can't defend this. Bigger players will come in. You won't be able to compete. 
your team isn't good enough or it's not a complete team, which is to say, we love you, but you, you don't have all the skills and the people at the table to get this done. And, this, and then the last two are very important because don't forget, we're putting our money at risk. There's no exit for this. So how are we going to make money? You haven't thought through who your acquirers are. And as a result, you can't tell me what my return will be. So what's in it for me? Why am I doing this? So if those are the objections, as soon as you think about that, you realize that what you have to do in these pitches is try and overcome as many objections as possible to shift them from no to maybe. And the sooner you do that, the better, because most people's attention span is very short. Uh, most people have great difficulty in paying attention for more than a minute or two in a pitch. So you have to hit these issues very fast. So just a word more on small commitments. So a large commitment, and I see this all the time, you know, people are pitching, thinking at the end, you're going to say yes or no. And they, they look at you as if you're going to say yes. Well, that is too big a commitment in a 10, 20, half an hour meeting. No investor is going to get to yes. So if you come in as an entrepreneur expecting a yes, you're going to be disappointed. What you have to do in, instead is ask for small commitments. And small commitments are things like, will you give me your business card? Will you sign up my interest list so I can communicate to you after the meeting? Will you take another meeting? And then the most important one of all, will you come into my due diligence process so I can share more details? If you can get them to a maybe where they agree to that small commitment, then that's success. They haven't said no, it's a success. And then you get the opportunity in due diligence to continue to tell them more and to convince them that they're interested. So we think moving, moving investors into due diligence is really what you're going to be doing. And that, as a result, is what you need to focus on when you're presenting. You are presenting in order to get them onto some sort of a due diligence process or list. And we published a free book. You can find it at the Apple Store. It's the Kretsu Forum Due Diligence Handbook. We use this to train our own members in how to do due diligence. But if you're an entrepreneur and you read this, you will be more prepared for what's coming if you, if you go through an organized angel network. It will also help you prepare your, you know, your, your Dropbox or your box folders because you want to already have prepared your due diligence before you get into it. The best due diligence is already 90% done by the entrepreneur before they even present. And this is also very important. If you present without preparing due diligence in, in, in advance, by the time you're in due diligence, you won't have time to create your due diligence and therefore it will not be a good due diligence process and you'll drop out. The next point is about storytelling. We were, we were all taught, you know, and Plato actually taught us and Aristotle taught us about the way to tell linear stories. And we think of it as being a beginning, a middle and end, a first act, a second act, a third act. And most entrepreneurs try and tell their stories in that way, which is to say that as an investor, I don't really get the big so what. I don't get the payoff, how much money is going to be made, how you're going to exit until 10, 15, 20 minutes into the presentation. And that's too late. I mean, as I already told you, most entrepreneurs have a mindset of no, and they're not even going to be with you for more than a couple of minutes before their minds have wandered. So a, a linear story is going to lose them. And so what you actually have to do is you have to tell your story in a very different way. Uh, and the way I'd like to talk about it is this notion that you're going to tell it three times. You're going to tell your story three times over. You're going to do a ramp, which is to, you're going to lead with your strengths, your key selling points, and you're going to tell them in two minutes or less why they should believe that you're a company that is worthy of a maybe remember uh, it's not a, a necessarily a yes and you need to preempt those 10 objections in the first two minutes so you need to have a very crisp very short story of that overcomes as many of the 10 objections as possible and leads with your strengths reasons why they need to pay attention 
that already is a differentiator because most other companies and most other presenters don't do that. And so if you do, they're going to, what's actually happening for them is they were leaning back thinking it's going to be a no. And then they say, crap, m most of my normal objections aren't going to work here. And then mentally they're leaning in and saying, maybe this is different. Maybe this one is, is something I should pay attention to. And then you're going to get more of their attention when you move into the body. The body is seven minutes, we say. It can be 10, but it's not 20, 30 minutes. And I'll talk more about what's in the body of your presentation. But you've got to keep it simple. And you're not doing anything more than reiterating what you just said in the ramp. And then the last one, we call it ABC, always be closing. Uh, but you're really just in one minute restating what you said at the outset. Why? What are the key success factors? What are the key reasons why they should do it? And you're asking for the small commitment. And the small commitment is all about driving them into due diligence process. You're not asking for a yes. Once you ask for a yes and someone says no, it's very hard to get them to change their mind. So you don't want to ask them for a yes until you know them quite well. So you ask them for something small that they can say yes to without them feeling that they're obliged to invest in you. So I'm not going to go over this in great detail given the time, but suffice to say the ramp, it's just about a powerful start. You're leading with your strengths and you're trying to kill the objections. The body, I actually really like uh, Guy Kawasaki's work. You can find it online, The Art of the Start. It's great stuff. He talks about uh, the 10, 20, 30. 10, you know, 10 slides, 20 minutes, and 30-point font. I actually think uh, it's 10, 7, 30. I already explained to you, we, as uh, for angels, they're not going to give you 30 minutes, uh, really. Uh, 20 minutes, sorry. They're not really going to give you that much attention. They have short time frames. I think VCs will give you more time if you ever get in front of one. But for angels and family offices, we encourage you to get to the point fast. And so that's why I talk about the body being more like seven minutes. This is his list of 10. Lo and behold, the 10 pages he recommends are really one page per objection. And I'm not going to go through this today. Uh, and then always be closing always be closing but know that the closing in that last minute is simply to get them to agree to continue to speak to get them into your due diligence process so that's really what i prepared to say i think if you took those 10 points seriously you would already be better than almost every entrepreneur that presents to angels because almost every presenter breaks at least half of these rules and if you just stick to doing what I just told you, I think you'll be in the top quartile of presenters. Alice and I have written some books that you can find everywhere. Uh, the first book actually is the one where we talk about all the essentials that we've learned in 15 or 20 years about early stage tech investing uh, amongst VCs and angels. It is American centric, but I think it's, a, it's an easy read. And you'll learn a lot. And you'll already have, also it loads you up with why early stage tech investing matters. And then these are my personal contact details, which I'll, I'll, I think Erica will share with you later. Suffice to say, if you're a company wanting to get advice about your specific company, what in practice I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you into the angel network and let the wisdom of crowd take, take its course. But anyhow, I hope that was useful. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Erica. You spoke about the different US and EU funding ecosystems. What are the major differences in Europe? Right. Well, Europe's a big place and every country is different. Uh, and so that's the first thing I'd say. I mean, I think I assume that most of you are in the UK and, and that's a good thing. UK is a global innovation hub. There's certain industries where the UK is right at the leading edge. And you have a, a reasonably well-developed capital formation ecosystem. So you have, angel, you have incubators, you have angels, you have angel networks, you have uh, VCs, well, micro VCs, real VCs, you have crowdfunding platforms like Cedars. So there's a lot in the UK that is very similar to the US. And whenever I look at the statistics, all the statistics say that you're about one-tenth 
of what the US is in terms of the numbers, number of VCs, uh, dollars invested, number of deals, etc. So I think if you're in the UK, everything I just told you is roughly right. I think that you have a few less angels as a proportion of uh, the ecosystem. I think you have a few more family offices. And I think that you, but, but fundamentally, the story is the same. If you go to somewhere like France, uh, or well, certainly if you go to Germany, it's much more about family offices, and it's actually less about angels and VCs. And the, the wealth of Europe is often in the hands of small business owners, the Mittelstand of Germany, if you will. And those family offices do back tech entrepreneurs, but they're very hard to find. They're very hard to find. And uh, you need to figure out how to get in front of angel groups, uh, sorry, uh, family office groups. There are a few, so Prestel and Partner would be an example of one that holds meetings in London and Wiesbaden and Zurich. You're gonna find it harder to find angel networks like Kuretsu. Um, I think that people tend to be a little bit more risk averse in much of uh, continental Europe. And so once again, uh, you need to tell your story in a slightly different way. They also have more, if you will, excitement around building medium-sized companies. Uh, in America, if you're here in Silicon Valley, everyone gets excited when you tell them you're gonna be a unicorn. I find that in Germany and Switzerland and Austria, people get quite excited if you can tell a story of how you're gonna be a very cash positive middle-sized business. And so it, it is a different type of a story and you're driving towards a, a different type of outcome. But fundamentally, you know, if you're in a global innovation center, Berlin, London, you know, New York, San Francisco, Shanghai, Singapore, it's roughly the same today. What you um, thought was about, well, it's about securitize a company that you're involved in. What do you think is preventing the digital securities market from taking off? Yes, it's a good question. I'd actually put that question the other way up, which is to say we started digitizing the world's assets 25 or so years ago with the Big Bang. You'll remember that Margaret Thatcher threw a grenade at the London Stock Exchange and we blew up open outcry and paper-based public equities trading and all of that went digital, at least first generation digital. So public equities today, high frequency trading and so on, it's all digitally enabled. That process of the digitization of the world's assets is still in process. So we have first generation, which as I mentioned is, is if you will, the trading of, foreign ex of, ex of monies, foreign exchange, the trading of public equities, they're somewhat all digitized. Then when we get into private equities, funds and real estate or property, it's almost all paper-based. So nothing is holding it back other than time and inertia. And this goes, Erica, to the point that we were making, uh, we were talking about before we began this, which is the adoption curves on digital technologies just accelerated greatly over the last six weeks. But the di digital millennials know this already. So digital mille millennials are already buying and selling assets through mobile first platforms like Robinhood here in the States, Robinhood or Coinbase in Europe, it might be Binance and and once you know, the investment side of a Revolut or Monzo really wrap, ramps up, you'll see digital, digital native millennials will embrace those technologies. So I'm, I, I'm a long-term investor. I have a long-term view. I don't see anything holding back the creation of digital assets other than time and inertia. It's an inevitability. It is going to happen. But obviously, a lot of things have to change. And when you get to the institutional end of the spectrum, it's very hard for big, big, heavily regulated institutions to embrace new technologies and, and even more new business process. And regulators have to enable that. And that does take time. But digital assets are an inevitability in, in every asset class. And I think that we just accelerated this greatly over the last few months. If someone's got a lot of users, thousands of users, but no customers yet, should they prioritize angels or VCs or what would you recommend? So I'm, so we need to just clarify uh, what a customer means because in some places we have, when we say customer, we mean intermediary 
and when we use the word we have end users they're the ultimate end user or do, do they mean does the question mean that they have non-paying users and they, they have use... no paying customers yet so they okay. have thousands right. of users but no paying customers they've just clarified okay so so i think that so you know i've the last 20 years i've been a substantial video game investor I've invested in a lot of very successful MMORPGs and virtual worlds and other things. And we like the try before you buy or the free to play model, which is we build traffic with users who may never monetize. And then we figure out how to attract in the whales, the, the, the high monetizing players as well. Now, if you are demonstrating the validity of your product or service to the underlying needs of users and not monetizing that can still be very valuable all right so if, if what you've demonstrated is that users love the product then it really does solve a need then that is important information the problem is uh the question of will you ever be able to make money off this which is i think my fourth or fifth objection typical objection so you're you're showing there is an opportunity. I have built a solution. People will use it. But now the question is, what's the value to the user? Right. And, and you need to be able to demonstrate that there's enough value there that they will pay. The other reason why uh, you could have a lot of users and no one will pay is that there's a lot of competition and some of the competition is free. So you still have a big challenge ahead of you, but I wouldn't be put off. And I would say, what you have to start doing is testing the, the benefit, you know, value minus cost equals benefit. You have to test the benefit in cells of your free users now and begin to show evidence that for some percentage of your free to use users, there is enough benefit here that they will pay for the privilege of your service. Because ultimately, you're not going to get funded if people believe that you're in that. And, and there are a lot of companies that are in that space of, I've got something everyone will use if it's free, but no one will ever pay, pay for it. So you have to begin to show the evidence that some people will pay for it, even if it's a very small percentage. In video games, it's a tiny percentage. You know, you could have 40 million users uh, and daily average users in the hundreds of thousands. And it might only be a handful of people that's driving all the revenue. No, perfect. Thank you. Next question from James McGraw. We've got quite a few questions for you. How do you feel about highlighting the blockchain aspect of a technology product following the whole crypto roller coaster boom and crash? And uh, obviously what he's talking about is the whole mess of the ICOs and a lot of the, the scams and the negative press around yes. crypto that how would you focus that would you talk about their saying should they be talking about blockchain more in the security aspect or do you see a lot of negativity around blockchain in the investment space and how would you include the mention of blockchain yes thanks erica so i think i've already demonstrated that i am in the category of people who's fundamentalist around it's all about the user and it's about needs and pain points and solving those for the users and creating value for the users. And I never believe it's about the technology. I, I'm not a believer in, in leading with technology. I'm a believer like in, in solving the problems that the people in the world more broadly have. And that if you do that well, the good things are gonna happen for you and your company and your initiative. Mike Moritz of Sequoia uh, says something similar. Uh, when he talks about, you know, they don't back verticals and they don't back technologies, they back people who can solve important issues in, in, in powerful ways. And I was on a webinar yesterday with Greg Kidd, who's the first money in at, at Twitter and Square and Coinbase and Ripple and one of the early investors in Robinhood and so on. And he says something very similar. So, so going back to your question, the fact that a lot of capital flowed to blockchain companies based on FOMO and, the, and that you could say I'm a blockchain based pizza company and people would throw money at you doesn't negate my point because the, that was just speculation and that was just easy money. Uh, some people got it, most of it went away 
and most of it was lost. If you're serious, if you're a serious entrepreneur and you're really trying to build something real and enduring, then I think what I'm saying is the point. Focus on the user, focus on the needs and the pain points, create a powerful value proposition, figure out which technologies you need to use. And if blockchain is one of those technologies, then, then that's fantastic. I can't believe that you will only use one technology. So even you know, really capable blockchain projects are using big data analysis or artificial intelligence or the internet of things or, or, or other sensors or other technologies as well. So it's very unlikely that you're gonna be a single technology solution and blockchain has some big challenges the, you know and, and obviously blockchain is very nuanced are we talking public or private permissions or non-permission and so on and so on so you need to i i would encourage you to not lead with blockchain i would lead with what i'm describing and then if blockchain is one of the technologies that you you know you need to be using then of course you're going to say that at the right time if you if you lead with crypto which is a slightly different point, right? Crypto monies and crypto assets are products built on blockchain technologies, distributed ledger technologies. If you lead with crypto, you will definitely chill 90 plus percent of investors, right? 90%, 90 plus percent of investors will not be interested at all if you say you're a crypto project. Uh, but if you say you are a disruptive, product or service enabled by blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology, at least you will get a higher percentage of investors that continue to listen to you. Thank you. Not that we're going after investment, but I hope they don't have the same response to crypto curry clubs. <laughs> Somebody is asking you to clarify that if you're asked for a second meeting, that that's a good thing. It's of course it's a good thing. Uh, yes, of course it's a good thing. Time is precious. Investors are busy people. Investors, well, so investors come in different categories. Uh, Full-time professional investors that are managing other people's money, they have to use their time in meetings where they learn about technologies and companies and products. So a second meeting with a VC isn't always a good thing. They may simply be trying to pick your brains, learn from you, maybe on behalf of another portfolio company, et cetera, et cetera. But if an angel or a VC offers you a second, uh, sorry, an angel or a family office offers you a second meeting, given how busy they are and that this is all discretionary for them, they don't have to do it. They don't have to invest money in this space. They can invest in any asset category they want. So if they're giving you their time, that's a very positive thing. By the way, one of the things I've, I've thought about, and maybe I should add to my top 10 list, is the other thing really good entrepreneurs do is they get an angel as a mentor and a coach. Because really, you know, someone who's been doing angel investing for 10 or 15 years is a very valuable resource for you. And, and get them on an advisory board. Don't even ask them for money. Ask them for their help. And if they like you, you and what you're doing, the value they'll bring will be worth multiples uh, uh, of, well, for, for most first time entrepreneurs, it will be a godsend. And even for serial entrepreneurs, it will be very valuable. Do you have any advice on approaching family offices for investment? You touched on this in Europe. Have you got any general tips? Yes. So, um, well, we've already talked a little bit about it's hard to find them. And also be, be aware that you have to segment family offices, just like you're segmenting the angels. So I've already explained angels. Angels come in different shapes and sizes. Were they an entrepreneur themselves? Were they a corporate type, a lawyer, a consultant, a banker? Did they, come, did they make their wealth in some other area? Like perhaps they were a property investor and now they want to do some technology investing. So what's their skill set? What's their capability set? How, uh, how many companies do they back? How long have they been doing tech investing? Uh, what's their current portfolio of investments? How do you fit into that? They're also often mission oriented because you know, most very wealthy people will have some philanthropy activities in addition to their investing activities. So what type of philanthropy do they do? Are they all about health? 
Are they all about education? Are they all about the climate and environmental change? And how does your project fit into their philanthropic in issues? So as you get to know them, which is why I had the page back, it's all about them. If I sit with an angel and I have a conversation with them, I begin to learn about what they like and what they care about. And if I was pitching them a project, I would have a better sense of how to tell the story and, and how to make sure it resonates with their interests. Well, that's true. Everything I just said is true for family offices. There are first generation family offices where the principal, the person that created the wealth is still active and, so, and is still making the decisions. And then at the other extreme, there are multi-generational families where you know, it may be 100 years since the money was made and the people you're speaking to were born into wealth and they don't know how to make wealth themselves necessarily. That's one spectrum. There are single family offices, be multi-family offices. Single family offices, it's just for one family. Multi-family offices are several families under one umbrella, which there's another spectrum then of self-managed to be professionally managed. Self-managed means the family office is making its own decisions. That's true of Alison and I, our family office, but there are, we're, we're first generation self-managed single family office. But at the other extreme, you would have professionally managed multifamily offices where the professional manager is very worried about their job and their return and not taking too much risk. So, so segment the families first, figure out which type they are, and then you're going to find you tell your story in a different way. The ideal for most entrepreneurs, in my opinion, is to seek out first generation self-managed single family offices where the person who created the wealth has an affinity for what you're doing. And so for example, if you were a health entrepreneur, go and find a family office of someone who is enormously well known in the health sector. So Bill Gates, I know that's, that's going way up to the top of the spectrum, but Bill Gates is a first generation, single family office manager, self-directed, he and Melinda make their own decisions. They do have professional people working with them, of course. They are highly focused on health. And if you show up with a great idea to change the world of digital health, for example, they're gonna be very interested. Now, obviously that's a very hard one to break into. But so that alignment, your project, you as a person, finding someone like you, but 30 or 40 years older, who, who has the same mission that you have and who wants to help you succeed, that is where you're going to most likely get your success. So you've got a lot of work to do to f figure, find out who are the first generation, self-managed, single family offices in your vertical, in your neighborhood. But if you can get in front of those people, your hit rate will be very high. That's good advice. What's the best way to raise funds from friends and family? He's saying, is it best to ask for a loan or to give equity or what you'd recommend there? And when is the right time to first approach your angel investors? Yes, this is the hardest question because this, I think, differentiates between true entrepreneurs and people who'd like to be an entrepreneur but aren't really. And the reason for that is that if you are really an entrepreneur and if you really believe in what you're doing, you will have no resistance to asking your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your aunt, your doctor, your, your professor for money. And likely you're going to lose their money. And that's the reality. So uh, most entrepreneurs fail and most startups fail. So uh, the truth is most entrepreneurs are willing to take money from those people and those people believe in them and will give them money, uh, but they will lose it. And so it's very, that's very, a very tough reality. You know, if you lose the money that your father and mother couldn't really afford to give you, it's a terrible thing. Right. So and, and it, there's a relationship aspect for that for the rest of your life. So this is a really difficult question. But why is it important? Because why would an angel give you money 
Because remember, an angel is just someone that worked their lives very, very hard to accumulate some capital. And now they're taking some of their hard-won capital and they're trusting you with it. How can they trust you with it if your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your aunt, your professor, your doctor don't trust you? Or you don't believe in your idea enough to approach them for money, right? So two of the biggest red flags to an angel are if no one you know has given you money. And if you tell them, my family is not wealthy and therefore I wasn't able to raise any money from the people I know, that's also a red flag. Because firstly, it's not true. Everyone knows someone who has money even if it's your doctor, as an example. But in addition, what you're really saying is you didn't work very hard to find wealthy people in your network. And you weren't prepared to pitch them. So this is a really important nexus question here. If you're a really good entrepreneur, you have to raise some money from friends and family. And you're going to have to deal with the emotional challenge of the reality that you will probably lose that money, but you have to raise it. And then the question of the structuring of it, you, it has to be common stock. You can't give preferential terms to friends and family uh, in terms of the structure. You can't give them a note because if you do that, the angels are going to ask for the same thing. We're not going to let you treat your friends and family better than you treat us. In fact, the reverse. You, you have to treat us better because we're professional investors. We are people that don't know you. So they have to get common stock and we are the ones that get the preferred series or series seed or, or, or the convertible note. So, so, so don't give out special deals at the beginning because you will just muddy the water for every round that follows. The book you mentioned of the the 10 uh, 20 30 it's art of the start guy kawasaki it's it, in a it's the most famous book on how to prepare yourself to to launch a company and raise money it's called the art of the start guy kawasaki and 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 it's old it's not a new book it's been around for i think 15 to 20 years but it's the book if if, if there were one book i would say just start with that plus there's a bunch of resources online the guys Patel. I like I like his work. Okay. What's the interest in, in investing now in blockchain? So not around the sort of crypto coin projects, but specifically around supply chain. Oh, well, so you, so I was gonna. There's one question for the first half, and then you threw supply chain in there. So let's. So so this is the great thing to be about to be a blockchain or a crypto entrepreneur right now. Here's the great news. The world is migrating to a digital future and the entire world will be a fully digital enabled economy where 8 billion people are connected continuously and everything we do is digitally enabled. That is an inevitability and we're, we're 30 or more years into that transition and we are a long way from the finishing of that transition. The adoption curves that we have struggled so hard with for the last decade are being accelerated right now. So it's at least 10 years that we've been investing in Silicon Valley behind things like virtual, well, digital entertainment, virtual health, digitally and technology enabled education, electronic commerce, digital payments, right? And the biggest challenges to those things was inertia. And the fact that people, many people, a large percentage, you know, we always have that adoption curve thing, right? Uh, early, you know, uh, early movers, early adopters, late adopters, laggards. Well, the truth was the late adopters and laggards weren't coming on board for those technologies. In the last four weeks, they had no choice. So every professor, every teacher, every student in the world knows how to do technology enabled education. They don't have a choice right now, right? And everyone in the world is, and every government and every company and every health insurer and every health network is right now trying to figure out what was that 
uh, technology or platform that would allow our doctors and nurses to serve the patients at home without meeting them. So all these adoption curves went through the roof in the last four weeks, and they're not going to come back down. They'll come down somewhat, but there's going to be a larger percentage of every segment of customer that says, I enjoyed working from home. I found that I learned better when I did the lectures on my screen. I like the idea of not having to go and sit in a waiting room for an hour to see my dentist. No, a dentist is not poss uh, possibly not the best example. Uh, my doctor. Dentists ultimately have to drill into your teeth one way or another. So why am I leading with that? Because that's what you need to get into your pitch. You need to get these points into your pitches. It's a great time to be a blockchain distributed ledger entrepreneur because distributed ledger is about distributed computing and storing and transactions and sharing. And those are part of a fully digitally enabled world inevitably. Right? It's just we weren't ready to get there. Now, all of a sudden, the world is more willing to have the conversation. The Bank of England has held the webinar and put out the white paper on the creation of a central bank digital pound. Now, Mark Carney was a little bit of a leader on this topic, the, the former governor of the Bank of England. But the reality was England wasn't ready, or Britain, the UK, I should say, <laughs> I wasn't ready for this conversation a year ago. Today, it is. So if you're a UK-based fintech building digital infrastructure to support digital payments and digital monies, the world just got much better for you. Now, the Bank of England also says they don't know that they'll use distributed ledger and blockchain in the creation of the digital pound. So you, again, going back to my earlier point, you don't want to over talk on blockchain, but it's a great time to be speaking to the Bank of England about how your startup can be a part of implementing the digital pound for the UK. You're going to have a very willing audience and maybe you'll get some funding, including potentially from the UK government. But if you lead with blockchain, you might put yourself into the right, wrong segment if the Bank of England's decided that in the first go round it won't be blockchain based. So, so anyhow, it's a long answer, but the big point is it's all about the digital future. The adoption curves just got much steeper. Your projects probably are more relevant right now than they were two months ago. You need to figure out how to embed that in your storyline but don't over talk to one technology because if you over talk to one technology, you may find you're alienating too many of your investors because you seem to be technology first instead of problem resolution first. If you've got any tips on how to maximize your chances of cold outreach to an angel or a syndicate being noticed. I think it's a very good question, and I think that it is uh, a cold call is the worst thing, uh, is the reality. So, so firstly, uh, you're going to have to try and contact a lot of people. Your hit rate is going to be small, and the rejection is going to be overwhelming. And again, most entrepreneurs don't like it. None of us like rejection. Most entrepreneurs happen to be slightly better at coping with rejection than most people and they, they don't stop trying. I remember one entrepreneur said to me, and I think it's a good point, he, you know, I, I said no, and most of what Alice and I do today, we're, we, we're, we prefer to give our money to professional investors, venture capital firms, which is why we manage the world's leading blockchain venture funder fund. But anyway, I'd said no, and the entrepreneur said, thank you, because that's number eight today. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I've got to get nine no's before I get one yes. So thank you for giving me the eighth no, because it gets me closer to the 10th. And I thought he was joking. And I, made, I, I, I joked with him about it. And he said, it's the way I keep myself going, you know, through the rejection. So, so that's the first point I want to make. You're going to have to go broad. You're going to have to speak to a lot of people. You'll be rejected most of the time. You've got to keep going. 
Now, obviously, what you really want are warm referrals. And warm referrals are very valuable, especially because it's a lot better if someone else says that you're worth speaking to than you say you're worth speaking to. You know, so any supporter you already have, regardless of whether they've given you money or not, you should be asking them and working them very hard for referrals. Right. So if you have a friend who's giving you some money, you should be badgering the friend. Who do you know? Who's your doctor, your professor, your father, your mother, your uncle, your aunt? Let me meet them, too, because those are warm referrals and you expand your 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 activities. Now, obviously, once you get an anchor, a bell cow. So what's a bell cow? A bell cow would be an influential investor backing your company. If you can get a bell cow, then their referrals are very valuable because they'll have a bigger network of investors. And if they say that I'm backing this company and I think I'd like you to meet the entrepreneur as well, then all of a sudden you're into this much broader dialogue and it's, it's warm referrals. What else should I say about this? Like I mentioned before, don't ask them for money. Ask them for referrals. Because the other thing is, if they refer you to someone else and there's someone else says yes, they may say yes too. So uh, sometimes asking for a referral is, is one of those small commitments that is more powerful and better than asking them for money. I heard another entrepreneur say in every meeting, they always finish the meeting with, are there a couple of other people that you would, be, would introduce me to that I could speak with? And in addition, is it okay if I come back? If, if, you know, as my story continues to solidify, is it okay? So they always ask for a referral and they ask for a, a follow-on meeting in every meeting. And you can see the geometric progression of doing that. So anyhow, I'm, I'm giving you some answers. I, I think that just spamming and cold calling is not really going to get you very far, but it's probably still something you should do. The reality is it's not going to get you very far until you've got a nexus of supporters and believers and hopefully one or two bell cow investors in, in your, in your uh, support group. Why are you two specifically Stockholm and Barcelona? We happen, to have, we happen to have chapters there. So if you went to koretsuforum.com, you can see the global chapter network. And there are uh, 55 chapters uh, of Koretsu. And we happen to have one in Stockholm, one in Madrid, one in Barcelona, one in Istanbul. We have Prague. We sort of have London and Paris, but there aren't a lot of members in those chapters. And there are very good angel groups in London you know, this city of London angels and people like that. So fortunately, London has plenty of angel groups. I would encourage you, by the way, to, to visit angel groups. And, and at Koretsu, we are very happy to have entrepreneur guests. So most of the companies we back are the convertible note into the Series A and the Series A. So we're not typically doing formation and seed capital. Other, other incubators and accelerators and angel groups are doing that type of capital. But you as an entrepreneur can uh, connect to your local chapter president and say, if you're having a meeting, is it okay if I come and sit at the back of the room and, and listen? And they'll tell you, so long as you don't pitch your company uh, in the networking, it's fine. And because uh, we don't want to have entrepreneurs badgering the investors when there are other companies that are actually formally presenting. Uh, but it's fine to learn. And I think one of the best ways of learning to be a good pres uh, a fundraiser is to watch really good fundraisers doing their fundraising. So in fact, almost all the best practices I shared with you earlier on this webinar were things that I learned by watching very good entrepreneurs raise a lot of capital and trying to answer the question, what did they do that other people weren't doing? And so it's sort of empirical, an empirical study. I encourage you to do that too. And, and then, you know, any place you're planning to go, you should, you should explore it yourself first. And that's very important, by the way. It goes back to this point of you need to know the investor. So if you're thinking of doing a Cedars campaign, you should probably already have a Cedars account and you should probably already go through a couple of Cedars fundraising campaigns of other companies 
and watch what's happening and watch the questions that are being asked and watch what materials the company is presenting and you should prepare yourself so you're better than what you're seeing. It's, it's a red flag if you get some entrepreneur who shows up and they ask a question like, how does CEDARS work? Well, what the hell, I'm, I'm an investor, I'm supposed to teach you. You couldn't spend the time to figure out how CEDARS works before you ask for money. So, so uh, like I say, uh, it's about doing your own homework, going online. If you haven't heard of Art of the Start and you're an entrepreneur in America, you haven't done your homework because it's the number one book on how to uh, prepare yourself to, to launch a company. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next question from Roberto. If you could discuss how you see VCs and angel groups current knowledge of blockchain, including differentiating crypto from enterprise blockchain permission versus permission permiss, yes. permission versus permissionless okay and i will pick up the prior question on supply chain here because i i'm appreciating i never got to the supply chain point so i'm going to split this into two questions the first is current knowledge of blockchain amongst vcs and angels uh, most vcs and most angels have no idea what this is about right so in America, we have more than a thousand venture capital firms. I, there's only a handful of them that are leaning into blockchain. In terms of the general purpose firms, Sequoia, Union Square Venture, RRE Ventures, Andreessen, Draper, these would be examples of well-known venture capital firms that are backing blockchain businesses, but most of them are not. So again, you wouldn't want to just randomly talk to a venture capital firm because you're going to waste your time you're going to be educating them you need to speak to the venture capital firms that are already demonstrating that they're ready to invest into this space so who are they well they tend to be the niche blockchain focused venture capital firms and the good news is there are quite a few of them now and some of the ones that are in london assuming you're in london i would call out fabric Richard Muirhead and Max Mersch, we're investors in their fund. And you can find Fabric easily enough. They are backing a lot of blockchain uh, projects. Another one would be the venture arm of blockchain.com, so Blockchain Ventures. That's Andy Kim and Sam Harrison. And we're also investors in their fund. And they're definitely ready to talk to good blockchain opportunities. There are others. I don't know some of the others so well. Well, 1KX, uh, Lassie Clausen and his partner, they're in Berlin and London, 1KX. They're doing more crypto projects, if you will. They're, they're, they're not so much equity investors as they're token investors, but they, they do equity too. So there's three names. So if you did your homework, you would find that there's at least 10 to 20 blockchain-focused venture capital firms in London. And if you're in Switzerland or in Berlin, uh, the good news is that they're there too. You're going to have to do your homework to find them. But one of the ways of doing your homework is to take a look at the websites of other blockchain and crypto projects and see who backed them. Or if you're even more disciplined, go to something like Crunchface and you'll find the lists of uh, who's backing which companies. You can even download the global database of crypto hedge funds and venture capital blockchain funds. You have to pay a bit of money to do that. And then you can analyze that to figure out who are all the blockchain VCs. Now, the second half of the question, which is differentiating crypto from enterprise permissioned or permissionless. Well, um, I've done a webinar which you can find at blockchaincoinvestors.com where we talk, in fact, there's several there, but we talk about the different investment themes underneath blockchain. Enterprise blockchain is, which includes supply chain and the use of blockchain to support identity provenance of not just products and services, but of people and of devices and of content. Uh, it's clearly a big area of possible use. I, I tend to view the world as a series of, you know, technology as a series of stacks. And so within crypto and blockchain, we have the foundational layer, which are the protocols themselves, the cryptocurrencies that are used to incentivize networks, 
and some of the things like distributed computing, distributed sharing. This is sort of the foundational layer. In there too is obviously all the mining, the e-bangs and the bit mains and, the, and, and so on. So that's the foundational layer. On top of that, we have the transactional layer, which for me in this space is a lot about digital monies and digital assets. So this is wallets, exchanges, payment systems and the like. And then on top of that, we have the applications. I think progress right now and what's getting funded are primarily the foundational layer and the transactional layer. It's sort of hard to find too many sort of application companies that are really moving the needle with blockchain technology. So, so if you're, that's why I sort of rolled my eyes a bit when you said supply chain based blockchain initiatives, because that's way at the top. It's an enterprise application of blockchain technology to an existing business process called supply chain management. And it's going to be very hard to win there. And the problem is IBM and Walmart and Carrefour and so on are going to try and make their own solutions win up there. So how would a startup succeed? It's, it will be hard. And I think definitely most application layer blockchain startups are going to end up being sold to bigger companies. So you're definitely, you're, you're playing in that goal. There's sort of a, it's a very legitimate thing to do. Create a company, raise a little capital, capital, sell it for maybe 20 or 30 million pounds and do it again and again. And if you're the entrepreneur, maybe you can make 10 million pounds each time. So that's pretty attractive. But, you know, your exit is a $50 million or less exit to a company. So you're building businesses to sell to companies, which is completely different from the distributed, you know, universe of uh, crypto projects and networks, uh, which is a whole different world. In fact, I haven't really talked about that, Erica, in the last hour. I've, I've really been talking about conventional equity-based investing into real businesses using these technologies. There is a whole different conversation we could have about how do you become the next polka dot or the next infinity and, and what does it really mean to be a distributed first crypto company? But uh, we, we don't have time for that. This has been fantastic. We're officially going to get you back every week with a different, uh, different uh, no. webinar title. And just as a slight shameless plug to Curry's Roberto, I don't know where you live. If you happen to live in London at the Crypto Curry Club events, we usually have several VCs and angels and investors at every event, including sometimes Matthew when he's in the UK. So yes. I love them. I love them. And by the way, and you don't know this, Erica, I've already, I've already received uh, substantial value from attending crypto, uh, sorry, uh, curry, uh, crypto curry club events. I'm um, happy to hear that. I'd yeah, love to hear more. Yes. I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you the story right now. So, but it, it's, I'm not, a, I'm not an entrepreneur. But I, I can sometimes figure out how to work a crowd to my advantage. And in this particular case, I, I went to the Mark Hipperson event. Mm -hmm. So first, first you have to say these are fun events. You know, uh, there's a really good crowd. There's some great people in the mix. There's investors, entrepreneurs, blockchain pioneers all in a room together. And the presenters are really interesting people. So Mark Hipperson was presenting Zigloo. And he's the guy that co-founded, I think it was Monzo or Starling, Starling, Bank, Starling, Starling Bank. Bank. And was and head so, of tech at Barclays for however long. Yeah. yeah, so this is a pretty influential guy. and He really understands blockchain and digital money. And so he's presenting Zigloo, which is his next big thing. It's going to be a, a, a dis disruptor to Revolut, Monzo and Starling, uh, which are the, you know, three, three of UK's darlings of the technology world, you know, unicorns. So... So anyhow, I went and I pitched Mark and Zigloo for a partnership for one of our companies. And, and lo and behold, we've just signed a partnership agreement with Zigloo, which will be announced at some point. My nice. point is, the point of that story, Erica, is you're putting together really important mixing events around crypto and blockchain. And if you were a serious blockchain entrepreneur, you'd be coming to those events because you never know who's there and who you can meet. Thank you for saying that. I know Mark has benefited I think, financially. He won't mind me saying that from the carries, but a lot of other companies have raised millions from the events. So without naming names. So thank you for that.
uh, plug, Matthew, appreciated very much. Alex has begged if I can get to his question next because he's got to run. How do you see the relationship between angels and micro VCs, such as VCs of sub 100 million under management? Do you see them operating at different segments of the market, either by stage or the type of opportunities? Or do you ever see that these two groups compete with each other for allocations? Interesting question. Yes. It is a good question, and it's part of the changing landscape of the last 10 years. So what happened after 2008 was there was a flight to quality in the venture capital community. Most venture capital or many venture capital firms went out of business. They couldn't raise new funds. And meanwhile, the really top tier venture capital firms raised hundreds of millions and billions of pounds and dollars, and they really became mid-stage investors. And so they... So they rarely invest before the Series A now, which is very important for entrepreneurs to know. It's part of what was embedded in my first page. If you approach a venture capital firm thinking they'll give you seed capital, the reality is they almost certainly will not unless you're a returning entrepreneur or you've been referred to, by, to them by the CEO of one of their more successful portfolio companies. Because the reality is they're not doing first round capital anymore they're coming in at the series A and later. And so that created this void. And that void got filled by angel networks and micro VCs. And so what's a micro VC? Well, in my mind, the, the big distinction between a venture capital firm and an angel or a family office is most angel, well, all angels and most family offices are investing their own money. And most venture capitalists are investing other people's money. So they are professional investors managing vehicles, funds, that are filled with other people's capital. And that's actually a very important distinction, whereas most angels and most family offices, especially the self-managed family offices, are investing their own capital. Now, in the middle of the micro VCs, what's a micro VC? Well, typically, a micro VC is an angel who has been able to create a small fund, or there are venture capitalists that are spun out mid-career and is creating their own first-time fund. And so that fund is small. It could be 25 million pounds or you know, plus or minus 10 million. It's a small fund, but they're very passionate. So if they're an angel, they're learning, to, they're, they're a first-time VC. And if they're a mid-career VC, they're very attractive people. Why? Because they're actually the people that were doing all the work at Sequoia and Kleiner and Permir or whatever, but they're trying to do it for them, but for, under their own umbrella. So they've spun out, they've created a small fund. Most small funds are small. They're going to work really, really hard with you, and they're going to be very helpful to you. And so micro VCs are very attractive. Now, they're not going to be able to do all the follow-on investing. So obviously, getting a Sequoia or a Kleiner early is an, an amazing thing if you can make it happen. But the truth for most entrepreneurs is you're not going to be able to make it happen. So then, yes, embrace the micro VCs and get to know them. And they're going to work really hard with you. And then they're going to help you. And they're going to do the pitch to the, the later stage, well, the next round investors, which will probably include a larger VC. Are they competitors to angels? Not really. I mean, in this world, there's uh, more than enough opportunities to go around. The good entrepreneurs are, are few and far between, but good angels back them, good micro VCs back them, and we all collaborate. And for the most part, VCs don't act nastily to angels because they know where their bread is buttered. I already showed you 90% of VC deals have angels and micro VCs already in them. So the really good VCs know that you don't, you don't purposefully expropriate your angels. You collaborate with them and you try and make it win for everyone. So it's more of a win-win thing than a competitive thing uh, in my mind. Right, thank you. Next question. Um, still got quite a few questions for you, but please do just say when you've got to disappear. Um, okay. and then we can maybe follow those up afterwards. But from David Satyan, what's the most preferable option? Uh, what would be the most preferable option for you? Would it be having a prototype and pitch deck for a seed round or angel early stage investment or building an MVP, which 
with continuous product iterations going to market, increasing the company value and going straight to series A investment round? Well, I don't think it's an either or and it's very situational. So I'm sorry to be vague. Uh, a picture tells a thousand words. Some working technology says a lot. It says a lot about your team. Uh, really good teams can build technology in their spare times. They don't need to raise capital to get a piece of technology stood up and working. Obviously, the final version of the technology may take a lot of time and energy and money. But so, so I have this phrase in my head called alpha engineer. And back in my consulting days, I did a lot of work at places like HP and Cisco and Microsoft, including in their developer organizations. And one of the things I learned was that if they had a thousand engineers, there were probably 10 or 100 who were alpha engineers. And actually, all the other engineers went to the alpha engineers for help and for advice. If you have an alpha engineer on a project, they can build the product and get it working in oftentimes weeks and in their spare time. So if you don't have any working technology, what you're really saying is that your, your co-founders and your engineering team are not very capable. So I would say, I think that you do need to start working on, if you're going to be, a, if, if your company is being built around a technology uh, or a, a solution, if you will, you need to start working on that solution and you need to minimum be able to show slices, you know, vertical slices and mock-ups and mash-ups very early. And I'm a big believer and you'll see in Guy Kawasaki's thing, he'll talk about the demo the demo can be a thin slice and you don't want to try and show it in real time. You want to video it working, but it has a place in the presentation. Now, the other thing that's embedded in David's question is the notion of bootstrapping, which is also a corollary of what I just said. Some of the best startups in the world get a lot of traction without raising any capital because they have fantastic teams that bootstrap because they are so good at engineering and they get up, they get started really, really quickly and very cheaply. And the capital that they raise is really more about scaling up than it is about getting started. And so again, the flip side of what I just said would be the big red flag is when a team comes to you and says, I've got a business plan. I need to raise capital so I can hire engineers to do it. Because what that's really saying is I'm talking to the wrong people. I'm talking to some MBAs or some corporate executives who think they're entrepreneurs, but they don't actually know how to build anything. And similarly, if they come and they sort of say, I've been spending a little bit of money in Romania, Lithuania, Pakistan or India or something with a, a development studio that's built me a little bit of a thin slice. Well, that's also a red flag because of what it's also saying is the internal team isn't strong enough to build the technology and the spaghetti code that you've just bought from some third party uh, could easily be abandoned and worthless uh, if that other company decides to, well, not to work with you anymore or, or conversely to uh, fork or create a second instance of your code and build a second company around it. So, so you do need to be able to bootstrap. Your team ought to be able to build some technology quickly. If you don't have an alpha engineer, put a lot of time and energy into finding one. And maybe some of them are at crypto curry meetups. You need alpha engineers on your teams. We've got quite a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for that. One question. What's the best option for approaching an investor? Where you said about going to investors for advice or for mentoring or for coaching or for briefly pitching the product, would you recommend that via LinkedIn or any other specific forms? Not really LinkedIn. No, I mean, you know, where are, so let's say we're in London and I don't know that London that well anymore. I sound English and I am English. I'm a dual citizen. I have a home in uh, Notting Hill, but the truth is I'm not in London all that much anymore, but maybe once a month uh, when I could travel. But let's take London. So in London, you have at least 100 incubators and accelerators. You have some of Europe's leading crowdfunding platforms, and you have a set of angel 
angel groups as well as networking organizations. And so I don't know all the names, but you have level, what's it, level 32? Is that what it's called? 39. Canary? And uh, the founder of that level 39 is in here. Well, fantastic. So you've got level 39, that's an example. You have City of London Angels, that's an example. You have Crypto Curry Club, that's just an example. And the investors are at those places. All right. So if I was a full time entrepreneur putting my every dollar I have, all of my time and my life's blood into my entrepreneurial startup, I would not be sitting in my garage writing code all of the time. Every day I would be at those events and I would be working the crowd. And, and my goal would be to get the cards of as many people at each of those events. I I would, I, I might go to crypto curry clubs and talk to Erica for five minutes, but I would make sure I talk to at least another 20 people. And of those two or three would be investors. So you're working the crowd, you're taking the business cards, you're asking for follow-ups, you're getting rejected much more often than you're getting any traction. You're asking for referrals, you're building out the, the list. Your, 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 I'll tell you the other things you're doing is you are cannibalizing and raiding everyone else's investors. So you're showing up at Cedars and you're paying attention to who are the fintech investors backing the fintech companies and you're getting their names by infiltrating the due diligence of the other companies. I know it sounds, but it's, it's competitive intelligence. You know, you're going along to level 39 on the nights when they hosting the investors and the companies, you know, they're, they're featuring the fintech companies and all the proud investors are there and you're raiding those investors on behalf of your project. And you're not trying to raise money because you're asking for too much, right? So if you can't give your pitch and expect them to say yes, you're asking too much. You're just building connections. Can I have your card? Can I, can I follow up with you? What are you looking at right now? Who are you investing with? You're building your database, right? So if you're an entrepreneur and you don't have an investor database with names and columns with attributes, what have they invested in before? How much do they typically invest? What, what philanthropy are they doing? Where do they live? You know, and if you, if you don't have that, then you're not a good entrepreneur because fundraising is probably 25 to 50% of your, your responsibility at the beginning. Unfortunately, but it's the truth. You know, you work harder on fundraising at the beginning than you than you ever do. It never stops, though. So you could also be the CEO of of Airbnb. Well, believe me, you're putting a lot of energy into fundraising right now. Well, thank you very much. Eric has also just messaged. Uh, Eric Lapvanderclay is the founder of Level Thirty Nine. He's just messaged. Thank you very much. And Matthew, to keep the networking going, he is the one person you should absolutely meet when you're next gracing us back in London. He knows the, the startup yes. accelerator ecosystem better than almost anyone. So. Well, I've been there a lot. So I, uh, I went there, I think, like in its second year of existence. My wife, Alison, spent 10 years chairing the Innovation and Technology Committee of Royal Bank of Scotland. And even though I think it was Barclays that backed, backed that particular incubator, we were there a lot. And then some of the companies in it, like TransferGo as an example, I know very well. And so I, I go quite a lot to level 39, but I use them as an example because it's one I know. Yeah. But the g generic point is there's at least 50 good incubators in London today. You probably have the list, Erica, of which ones take blockchain seriously. But if I was a blockchain entrepreneur, I wouldn't pick one. Rise, you know, just so it's not all about level 39. <laughs> you know, Bart is also back to Rise and Rise is in Moorgate. And if I was a blockchain entrepreneur, I'd also go to all the Rise events. Yeah. And in fact, I'd make a point of going to at least the top 10 fintech incubators in London every month because that's where the investors and the other entrepreneurs and the corporate CVCs, the corporate venture capitalists are. So you've got to be there too. A few of the banks now have them. It's become fashionable to have their own blockchain uh, incubator. So just a couple more questions and then we will let you go to your... Somebody is asking about discuss, fundraising with STOs, so security token offerings, the thing yeah. that became fashionable after ICOs and I'm still slightly cynical about, but would love your viewpoints. They're asking when and how will investors be excited or comfortable about 
these? All right. So I am chairman of Securitize in Europe and Securitize is, we think, the world's leading security token platform and technology company. Uh, but it's not about the technology. So the first point of this question is it's not about STOs. It's about the digitization of assets and investments. And so to answer this question, you have to begin with, well, what are, is the underlying? Is it a private investment? Is it a real estate project? Is it a real estate fund? Is it a fixed income product? Is it a piece of mezzanine financing to an emerging unicorn? So what is the underlying investment and who wants to invest in it? And how does a digitized version make it easier for them to onboard, hold or offboard and sell that investment? And once you start going down that path, then the adoption curves and the ramp ups begin to vary also by jurisdiction and geography. So very closely with all the top financial institutions and the ministries and so on in Japan, and they're very excited about tokenizing real estate, uh, putting real estate funds and projects and REITs onto digital versions. And you'll see those later this year and next. But in Switzerland, in Zug, it's much more about tokenizing, on the one hand, private investments, which is sort of like a follow-on of ICO, IEO, STO. And then more importantly for Switzerland, it's about funds, because Switzerland is one of the world's leading fund and wealth uh, management centers. And they have the belief that all of the certificates and feeder funds that they create today could be tokenized. And that isn't an entrepreneurial point of view. That is the government of Switzerland and the Swiss financial authorities and SIX and SDX and so on uh, driving that story as well as UBS and Credit Suisse and so on. So, so th the question is, firstly, segment the asset class and jurisdiction and the issuer and the investor. And now we can have a conversation about the adoption of digitally enabled versions of those investment opportunities. The rate of adoption is varying across that matrix. But what is absolutely true is we will have a 100% adoption of digital assets in the future. No question. It's just a question of where and when and how. And within our lifetimes, that is going to happen. Just as I started off by telling you Margaret Thatcher blew up the London Stock Exchange and all public equities are today traded as digital, digital assets. So as an entrepreneur, this is a huge opportunity. The challenge is it's not necessarily a quick, uh, a quick win. And so you've got to be thoughtful about that. At Securitized, we've raised tens of millions of dollars and we have partnerships with a, a large number of institutions ranging from Mitsui and Nomura and KDDI and Sony to Santander and Barclays and, and a host of others because uh, this, is a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. What are your thoughts? And I guess you'll have slightly different thoughts to maybe most investors seeing as you are so open to the blockchain and, and digital security space. But what are your thoughts on companies that have previously done an ICO and have a token if, if they have users and paying customers, but would that put you off? Oh, uh, so this, this is a good question. So, so let's- a Legitimate project to clarify, yeah. which I'm assuming it is. Yeah. Well, I didn't toot my horn at the beginning. Now I'm feeling I should, because it's, it's not just that we are open to blockchain. You know, Alice and I operate the world's only blockchain venture fund of funds. We're investors in all of the top blockchain VCs. Alison chairs the advisory board for blockchain capital. We are very invested in a lot of projects from Bitwise and Securitize. And, and I'm vice chairman of SFOX, which is the leading crypto prime dealer in America. So we, but why? Well, we've written a book on this. You can, it's called Blockchain Competitive Advantage. It's available everywhere. And it talks about why. And it's not about blockchain. It's about what I've been saying. It's about the transition to a digital economy digital assets and digital monies and payment systems and it's an inevitability 
So, so now, you know, you get back down to this question and the reality is you, you know, there are a lot of people like us and ICOs were a proof of concept and they were also a black eye. They were proof of concept because they did demonstrate that technology enabled investing was possible. Billions of dollars changed hands, even though that's a bit of a flaky number because I think most of it was token swaps and I have issues with token swaps. But even irregardless of that, ICOs demonstrated that technology enabled investing was possible. But of course, sophisticated investors know it's all about the due diligence and no due diligence was done on half of those projects. And, and, and capital is a magnet to bad actors and bad practices. And so ICOs were a magnet to all the wrong people. And as a result, most of the ICOs were fake. Then, in addition, people that did ICOs got too excited by the money they raised. And some of them took some of the money and some of them spent the money too much and too quickly. And, and those are also red flags for serious investors. So, Cameron, if you're one of those people that did an ICO, raised some capital, have been a good fiduciary on behalf of your investors, have really worked hard to build your project, have worried about every dollar and pound and made sure you haven't squirreled it away and wasted it, then there's nothing wrong. In fact, there's a lot of positive things about the legacy and the history that you've created over the last few months and that you won't put off any investors. But unfortunately, most companies I meet that did an ICO broke a whole bunch of the, of, of the rules of investing. And sometimes the, the ICO promoters stole some of the money. Sometimes they've sold it. They've spent outrageous amounts of time and money in a very short period of time. Sometimes they haven't actually built workable technology. Uh, sometimes they ha they've taken their eye off the ball, ball and they haven't really progressed their use case and their value proposition. And so the truth is most companies that did an ICO today, if they try and raise more capital, are not going to get it. Um, I'm hoping, Cameron, that you're in that other category, but most of the ICO projects that we listen to broke at least a number of the rules of, of good entrepreneurialism and, and investors hate to see that. Right. I mean, it would be good to get your opinion on this. A conversation I had with some people in the real estate sector. So one of them has a, uh, is a member of the Currys, but they've got a software for estate agents and that side that basically does a lot of the work that Linda and whatever in back office do. And they said uh, what they think will happen because a lot of say i mean just estate agents but this could apply to every industry where they've furloughed workers or even sacked workers that they'll find that instead of paying x amount of people to do those jobs that they'll they'll out like you said out of need like in all just out of need find a software that will do that or find a way to do it digitally and then realize that they won't need to employ those people again so even if the business survives that uh, they'll just use a software program instead of x well i think I, th I think that's right. This is back to the point that uh, late adopters have had no choice but to engage with new technology-enabled ways of doing their businesses. And they're, they're, so if you took something like Zoom, you know, we're on a Zoom right now. Zoom has just announced that it's uh, uh, doubled in terms of the number of active users. And it was already quite large. It's getting a lot of heat from presumably other platforms that are trying to uh, compete and uh, are saying Zoom has challenges. But at the end of the day, there's an awful lot of people trying out Zoom for the first time. Yeah. And once you've tried it, of course, you know how to use it. So whether you use it every day or some of the time, yeah. you, you've, you've broken through that resistance barrier of never having done it before. Yeah. And, and so that's true everywhere. So, so if you look at digital payments, digital transactions, the use of collaboration tools, yeah. all of these things are seeing huge spikes. But um, do you think that there's going to be digitalized 
voting at some point, because um, I know we have some serious standards that are going to be going on here in San Francisco Bay Area with social distancing. So do we think that 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 field is going to, I guess, be pushed forward a little bit more around the globe? Well, it's a great question because there are other countries that have fully digitally enabled voting already. And America's been a laggard on that. So in America, we still have states where things are filled out to a large extent by hand. And that was why we had those, you know, the the, uh, issues in Florida uh, a few, well, that's a few years back. But we we are actually not the most sophisticated in the world at at the way we vote. So, yes, in the medium term, it's clear that we're going to, we should have already and we will implement digital voting, of course, we have to solve the problem of digital identity because we don't have a good U.S. identity system today that is immutable, secure, and portable. So, you know, that, that, so if, you go, if you think about the layers of change that need to occur, the U.S. government needs a better form of identity. We need a better form of money. And then we can work on things like a better form of a better, a better approach to voting. But I'm well, absolutely sure all of these things are being accelerated right now. The reason I was asking is because that is what our company does. And we have been able okay. to do some authentication and do some identity protection. And we're looking to raise capital. We weren't planning on rolling out till 20. 20- 24 because of some of the difficulties within some of the states here, but we thought about looking um, with the COVID-19 virus, we thought about it might be our time to start getting some traction within this whole market. So that's why I'm actually on this call because of that reason. Oh, well, I think there's a short term and a medium term thing. I mean, short term, you still have to worry a lot about Mm -hmm. bootstrapping, managing your cash, but I, I, we're seeing an awful, awful, awful lot of startups. In fact, I was at an event yesterday, a global investor conference that we held. Uh, we had about 300 or so investors dialing in, and we had 12 companies presenting. And, I, and the companies had been chosen because they each had been able to think through why they were part of the solution to the terrible situation we're in the middle of. And so I'd encourage you to do that. You know, you need to put on your, how do we help resolve the challenges of today? And if you've got a compelling story for how you'd help in the general election in America that's coming up in November, then then presumably governments should pay attention. But it doesn't mean they'll implement you by November. No, so, I don't. Think, I don't think they will implement us by November. I mean, we looked at. We've looked at security. We've done a lot of things around. We created a security technology to be able to do that. But what we have found is is that the U.S. voting standards they have different standards per state, and these states all have different voting standards within there. So we had tried. I mean, we've been bootstrapping. We've bootstrapped a lot of money into this. And so what we've been looking at is that we would have to, at this point, go to the certain secretaries of states, because as you know, a lot of primaries and a lot of the um, things that normally would happen have not happened. They've all been delayed. Puerto Rico has been delayed. Hawaii has been delayed. A lot of these other primaries have been delayed. So that's what we've been looking at trying, using contacts that we know to try to even get into that, because we are bootstrapping. We've bootstrapped it. We've got our app developed and it is working and we're looking for um, an extended beta on that for our app. I can easily connect you to the local, you know, Koretsu Angel chapters for whatever city you're in, assuming we have one in the city in which you're in. Well, Um, I'm in San Francisco Bay Area. Yes, so obviously, you know, Koretsu is very, we have about 400 (laughs) angels in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, Silicon Valley and the East Bay. And so I can, I can certainly make those types of connections for entrepreneurs who want to figure out how the angels go about uh, giving companies money. That's amazing. Thank you so much. That's the last of our questions, but everyone is shouting praises for your advice and feedback and knowledge in the chat. So I just hope that we can get you back for more knowledge downloads, either in webinar form or at real life curry, whenever that may be. Well, there's no if about that, Erica. I'm a crypto curry club member and I will be there if I'm allowed to travel.